Yeah. I don't think they're ready for this. Gotta give it Forget about it. Hey, yo, at the speed of sound. It's the world now, wax works compound. So gather around and witness something that is rarely found. The Database Building Block seminar series is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This program is made possible by Google. Alright guys, uh, welcome, thank you for joining us. It's a new semester on uh, on databases. So t this semester's data database seminar series is on uh, what we're calling the database building blocks. The idea is that there's these libraries that you can you can cobble together uh, and, and build full-fledged systems. And so data fusion is one of the, the, the I will say the hottest one, the major, most trending ones right now. Uh, and so we have actually somebody who's, who's been working on it, Andrew Lamb, giving a talk with us. He's currently an uh, engineer at an InfluxDB, where, where they're based off um, they're, ba they're based off uh, Data Fusion. But actually, next week, which I'll talk about at the end, we actually also have Andy Grove, who is the creator of Data Fusion. He's going to be giving a talk about Data Fusion Comet, which is something they've been they've been building at Apple. So. With that, uh, before we get started, uh, keep everyone mic uh, muted. Uh, mic muted. If you have any questions, just unmute yourself and fire away at any time. Don't have to raise your hand. Don't have to like wait till the end. But please interrupt. That way, it's it's interactive for Andrew, and he's not talking to himself in Zoom for for an hour. So that Andrew, thank you so much for kicking off the new semester. We we appreciate you being here. Oh, I'm totally psyched to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. yes. So here I'm going to talk about uh, Apache Data Fusion. I'm going to talk very quickly because the universal feedback I've gotten from this deck is that there's no way I'm going to get through it in time. So challenge accepted. Let's get started. I am going to talk today about data fusion. This is some of my background. I'm currently a staff engineer in Influx. As Andy Grove talked about, I've been working in the enterprise software world for 21 years. I've worked at places like Oracle, and Vertica, whatever. And I um working at Influx for the last four years on data fusion and Arrow and Apache, uh, the product we built on top of it. I'm also the chair of the Apache Era Data Fusion PMC project, and I'm on the Apache Arrow PMC as well. And I once upon a time went to MIT and got an M Engine Core 6.2, if that means anything to you. And I got I actually studied compilers, so I'm a, I didn't come directly to databases, but I started compilers. So with that, I also wanted to point out a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about in this talk uh, is covered in the paper, so I might just blow past it. But we had a paper in Sigma this past year that describes um, more formally the architecture and especially a bunch of the uh, um, performance results that I'm going to talk very briefly on. So if you want more information, go check the paper out. So here's basically what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what's data fusion, why you need it, and then I'm going to cram as much as I possibly can into the architect about how it works internally, and I'll touch on this, this performance. What is data fusion? Here's my my big, biggest pitch, right? So in my mind, the best analogy is that it's it's the LLVM for databases. So what do I mean by that? I mean, LLVM basically enable the whole raft of innovation and programming languages. So like the reason you can have languages like Rust and Swift and Julia and a bunch of them, right, is that they don't, each of those people don't have to re-implement the same uh, low level opt compiler optimizations, loop unrolling, register allocation, code generator, um, for specialized architectures, whatever, like the debugger integration, lots of very important, but not specifically uh, very um, differentiating stuff. And instead they can focus on their language and ecosystem libraries and stuff. The same way, basically, right? The, the idea is data fusion lets you do the same thing specifically for OLAP databases, right? So rather than you, if the next person wants to build the next, you know, fancy data processing system, rather than re-implementing like a, a fancy vectorized query engine yet again, Instead, you use data fusion, you customize it where it's necessary, and instead you focus your time and effort mostly on the pieces that are important for your application. <laughs> so that's the piece. It's supposed to basically be a shared foundation that then a lot of other data systems are built on top of. That's the high level. So it's architecture. Uh, the, ar the high level architectural goals I think are kind of cool is that it, the goal is that it works out of the box. So you get up and run, like this is designed for people building database systems. It's designed to get up and running out of the box as soon as possible. So that means like, I'll show you, it's like three lines, you get get running, you get a full featured SQL query engine. And then you can basically customize everything. I mean, everything, I mean, pretty much everything, which I'm gonna ta talk about that in quite a bit more detail the rest of the talk. And I think the other thing that's important is that we, we purposely don't try to pick the latest and greatest, you know, research that comes out. No offense to researchers here, but it's the idea is we go re-implement industrial best practice with well-known patterns, right? That's part of why it's easy to read. Someone mentioned before we started is because it basically looks like you'd expect a query engine to look because that's because it's following the classic design. And so people start quickly and then they basically over time as they have uh, engineering needs uh, or resources rather and needs, they can customize and suit 
customize the thing for their their own needs. And so one of the things that makes it cool is you can kind of actually try out new ideas and like a real production system much more easily, right? You don't have to go figure out the guts of some tightly integrated system. Instead, you can uh, just test out. So here's some interesting use cases that people have done. I think this is, you know, giving you a preview, frankly, of what's going to be coming in the rest of the seminar series. But we've had people who use it to build entire database systems, which we'll talk about, right? But there's some examples here, including uh, streaming, as well as sort of more classic analytic systems and time series databases. People also used it for its execution engine and for various front ends, which I'll talk, you know, Andy mentioned Apache Spark, uh, Comet for Apache Spark, which we'll talk about later. And there's there's several other ones, including like Postgres accelerators and uh, visualization language accelerators, Bega Fusion. People have also actually used it for its front end. So uh, they also, interestingly, it turns out when you implement a table format, you need something that looks like a query engine typically, often to implement like predicate-based elite tombstones. Right, like if you want to delete stuff, but that's um, you actually need to evaluate an expression. That's that's basically you need an execution to do that. Likewise, compaction. So I think we've got the. It turns out all the Rust implementations of Delta Lake, Iceberg, Lance, and Hootie all actually use Data Fusion, uh, which is kind of cool. And then we've also seen an increasing use for academic experiments. So there's actually some, you know, this is a, a cool recent example where someone implemented some specialized time series index. It's basically like a modern version of like an OLAP cube, but then was able to implement a pretty straightforward rewrite in Data Fusion to show that queries like end to end ran much faster when, you know, unsurprising when you rewrite to use the index, it goes super fast. But it's kind of neat to see that it's, it's able to be used in that sort of way. I wanted to visually point out what this means. Like, you know, I've talked about blah, 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 all these use cases. Here's a bunch of boxes that kind of show at a high level pieces. I'm going to go into this in much more detail, but I wanted to point out like visually, right? Some people use everything, all these pieces. Some systems only use part of it, right? We're going to talk about this. I think there's the common misconception, like data fusion's only the execution engine, but right? it actually has a full on SQL planner, function library, all that kind of stuff. And, you, you know, so you can actually use the front end in addition to just the back end. So interestingly, I've, it, we, we have people who and users who do all, all of those. And of course, the classic question when you talk about a modular system and it's reusable and all that sort of stuff is that performance is going to suck, right? Because first of all, all the traditional systems are all very tightly integrated, tightly integrated, meaning that you basically um, have a tight integration between the storage system and the memory uh, model and the query executor. Like it's all very tightly integrated because the classic argument is that you need that tight integration in order to get reasonable performance right? because otherwise the, the interfaces slow you down. And I think that's, in my, I, we have very good performance in data fusion. I'll talk a lot about that later. Practically speaking, and this definitely mirrors my experience in industry, really what's typically, you know, as long as your architecture is not terrible, what's actually the limiting factor in performance is your en re available engineering resources. It's not, you know, the nitty gritties of whether or not you can optimize a particular code path. It's how much engineering effort you can invest. And so I think by having well understood module boundaries like Arrow, which we'll talk about uh, in Parquet and stuff, you can really the engineering effort you do have and that you can harness from these open source communities, you can actually focus and really, you know, you can obsess about making kernels really fast, even though they still have to conform to the arrow, arrow format. And that you can see, like we've got very good ClickHouse benchmarks. There's even better ones coming, but, uh, but I'm quite pleased with how it works. So why, like that's kind of like the high level what data fusion is. Why would you use data fusion? I've already touched on it. It's basically like, it's a lot of work. Like as Andy touched on, I've done this before. I did it at Vertica. I've seen other people do it. You can go look at how much money it takes to like build a new analytic database by looking how much money uh, that similar companies raise, right? It's like hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more. And so uh, doing it again, right? You can do it, but it's very expensive. And so, and on oftentimes, unless it's something that you're going to do something really different, if you're just going to reinvent what, what people already know how it works, you might as well just use what, what um, already exists. And so, especially when it's required, but not really a differentiator. And so obviously with this, you can focus on what makes your project different and you share the cost of the underlying infrastructure. I'm pointing out here, share, it's not like you just get it for free. Like you still have to do work to use data fusion, um, but it's a lot less than you'd have to do if you did it yourself. Obviously this is a pitch, right? If you hadn't picked this up already, like come do your next project with data fusion, help us make it better by, by building your next project slash startup with it. Speaking of the community, right? Here's some metrics that show how big it is. By the way, this was not founded by a company. And they like donated to Apache on like a lot of sort of similar systems. Instead, it was actually founded by Andy Grove, who's going to talk next week. I think basically because he was interested in how query engines worked, um, donated to the Apache Arrow project. And at this point, it now has, you know, hundreds of distinct contributors, cranking out releases every month. We've done it for multiple years and it's just uh, just getting going, I think. So anyway, it's like the community's big and it's and it's real.
and it keeps going. I also think it's a very important technology. We're kind of in the right time. This don't please don't obsess about exactly where all these different pictures are or whatever. The idea here is that there's just more and more specialized database systems as time goes on. And I don't see that slowing down. In fact, if anything, it's accelerating. And so having something like data fusion is just going to help the trend go, right? Rather than these each one have to have either a crappy handwritten query engine or invest a huge amount in building another really great one. They can just reuse data fusion. By the way, I thought it was kind of fun. Why is data fusion called data fusion, right? I'm not going to read this to you. You can read the blog. But basically, Andy Grove's algorithm was, well, clearly it has to have data because it has something to do with what's going on. And then he just fires up a couple of words that sound cool, like fire and fusion and, and whatever else, and then picks whatever sounds good. So he picked data fusion. That's the meaning of the name. And then tried to back justify it with like, maybe it had something to do with data fusion or whatever. But uh, he also mentioned he was driving a Ford fusion car at the time. So possibly that had something to do with it. So anyway, that's, that's where data fusion came. With that as a side, here we go. Let's talk about the architecture. So I'm now going to cram as much as I possibly can at you, mostly so that you have an understanding of how this thing works, um, that if you want to go delve into it more deeply, you can. I don't expect you to understand all the details. So here's the high-level architecture. This is the picture from the VLDB paper. I mean, uh, the Sigma paper, I'm sorry. Uh, the point of this picture is that, one, this should look like every other execution uh, uh, query engine you've ever seen, right? It's got a catalog and, a da and da uh, various data sources. I'll talk about all this stuff in more detail later. It's got various front ends. It's got a represent like a logical plan representation, which represents a high level relational operator tree, a bunch of rewrites on that execution plan, low level physical thing, right? The physical plan that has more details. And then it's got all the optimized implementations, which is uh, in the execution engine. The point of these blue boxes here is to show that you can basically extend the system anywhere. So yes, you can stick, you know, new functions in, but you can also stick new relational operators in. You can implement your own execution uh, streams and basically everything else. And I'll talk about that along the way. Boring, but important, of course, is documented. Someone actually mentioned this before. There's obviously user documentation. I think there's plenty of systems that have that. But I really wanted to emphasize there's actually quite a lot of documentation written, designed for people building the system, right? So there's low-level API write-ups for, for like, if you want to build a system with this, not just use the SQL. Um, so that's just the plug. So now I'm going to talk through some of the high-level architectural de uh, points, and then we can talk through... Um, I'll, I'll go into more detail. So one of the high level choices is that it uses arrow internally, right? Not just at the interface. So you typically, like when you're building one of these systems, you'll have the choice of, do you use arrow or something similar? Like when you're building a, a column or executor, do you use arrow internally, like within the, when you pass data between the operators, or do you use something internal specialized for your system? And then you convert to arrow at the interface. Obviously the pros of using arrow internally, right? The, the first obvious one is that you don't have to, there's no cost to convert at the edge. But I think the far more important one from in practice that I found is you actually then can reuse all the, the fact that there's an arrow library and you can take advantage of all the effort that goes in there. So in particular, there's a lot of obsession that's occurred. Uh, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, like make the low level arrow kernels really fast, like do low level operations. And so by reusing the arrow and arrow implementation, you get access to that. Now I drew this picture, it's somewhat misleading. Arrow is actually used you know, within the aggregate, the, the internal memory structures of how the hash uh, group by hash thing works absolutely is not directly arrow. Like it's certainly inspired by arrow, but it, it's, you know, its own thing. But when the operator produces output, like the interface between them is all arrow record batches. Um, or, and I'll show that later. And, and of course, the the upside of this, uh, this, this design, right, which is the more classic one where you have your own internal implementation, is that you can specialize and do whatever you want, right? And if, specifically, if Arrow doesn't have some feature, you can add it, right? Like uh, selection vectors being an obvious one that Arrow doesn't have that might be valuable. But the downside is you have to convert it to Arrow. But I think the real downside is you actually have to now maintain all this code. And if you want to like have people write uh, extension functions, you have to somehow bridge whatever they're writing to, to this internal stuff. Another very, I think, difference about data fusion is it's implemented in Rust. Initially, like I think realistically why it's written in Rust is because Andy Grove thought Rust was going to be the hot thing back in the day. And this is a hobby project. So he just like basically took a flyer. Uh, and at that point, if you were like doing this for real, you probably, or for like a, a job, you probably would have picked like the safe bet would have been C++, right? Because that was well understood. All the, all the significant database systems were written in that, possibly Java, but people probably realized that was a fad. The downside, it was, like it's hard, it's hard to write correct code in C++. I can tell you all sorts of horror stories about me personally spending lots of time tracking down multi-threaded race condition crashes that happen like once you stress the system for three days or whatever. It's it was terrible. Also, 
why the hell can't it find the freaking symbol that I just wanted? To, like, I don't understand. Like, I've also fought the build system far more than I want to explain. So Rust, the upside, you know, the, the upside of Rust, the pitch was it has memory and thread safety, which I'll talk about in just a moment. It's a hipster language, right? So that actually that seems to attract more people. Uh, I know it sounds silly, but actually it actually seemed to work. A lot of people were interested in learning Rust, so they come come work on our project. It has modern tooling, which sounds stupid, but it's just like, you know, I don't have to fuck around with dependencies. It just works. Um, the downside was, especially when this was, this was being picked six years ago, Rust was not at all the obvious choice for database implementations. I think now it would be fine. Like people wouldn't look at you weird, but I think early on it was, it was not the obvious choice. The lessons learned from my perspective has actually been great. It basically lived up to the hype. I thought I was, you know, I got hired, uh, Paul Dix, the co-founder of Influx said like, we're writing this thing in Rust. I said, I don't care as long as I can write code, like I'll just write in whatever language you want. But, um, but yeah, like I have, you know, depending on how you count, there's been one memory issue of four, four and a half years. It's been, been phenomenal. Now you definitely spent a lot of time fighting the compiler, right? Don't get me wrong. But once it compiled, like it was, it was, it was, it was money. And I think another thing that I've, I've come to only appreciate more recently is that by having the compiler enforce the memory safety constraints, right? That sounds great in theory, right? Obviously no one's going to complain about that. It actually helps a lot when what you're building is this big open source project, because instead of relying on expert code reviewers to catch the weird race conditions, you actually just let, them, let the compiler do it. So I think that actually allows us to get a lot more people in hacking on this thing, right? And they can't cause the kind of damage that you could cause if they just went, you know, and you let some random person start writing C++ in a big complicated C++ code base. Um, at least that's my, that's what I, and also, you know, the, the, I kind of said the package manager is amazing. And I said, it was easy to start with data fusion. Here's my example, right? There's this three lines. If you want to start a project with data fusion, you run cargo, blah, 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 my new project, you go into the directory and then you go cargo add data fusion and you build it. And like, now you're ready to rock. You've got a full featured SQL engine that you can start customizing right away. So, and that's it, right? You don't have to, don't have to do anything else. So that, um, it worked pretty good. So the, the, the multi thread. The multi-threaded yeah. bugs, the, the lack of the lack of like multi-threaded bugs is not. I mean, it's partly Rust, but also like there isn't a lot of. Maybe I'm wrong. Like concurrent data structures, you maintain concurrent state because it's, you're you're running analytics. It's not like you're running transactions, right? That is true. But there's nothing about Rust that prevents you from doing concurrent transactions. I think yeah. it's just like if you try to do it in Rust, it's just very very. It's a it's yeah. an exercise in frustration with the compiler. Just like, let me do the freaking thing I I've been doing in C++ for 10 years. And they're like, no, no, you can't do it. And eventually you understand why it's telling you that, but it's it's definitely frustrating at first. So I don't think there's any reason why Rust couldn't be implemented, like used for transaction systems, but but certainly we haven't we haven't done it. And then and maybe, maybe, maybe you'll get this in a second, but like <clears throat> you just showed an example of like, okay, I create a new project, bring in the, the data fusion cargo. Uh, can you briefly talk about like what other cargos you're relying on in data fusion or is everything written from scratch? Well, no, no, no. It's it's uh, like Python projects. It ends up with a huge dependency tree. I don't, I can't list them off, but there's, there's probably a, okay, but like, probably, the, like at least a hundred transitive dependencies would be my like Togai. Like, are you relying on like Togaio? Like, are there like the, some of those common things people are using oh, yeah. to build Rust? Rust okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'll talk about Tokyo Tokyo later. Um, okay, but yeah, it's like Rust. You know, because it's so easy to add to new dependencies, which is great. Uh, one of the downsides, well. One of the implications of that is you end up with a whole bunch of dependencies. Data fusion is no exception to that. We fought against adding like all sorts of crazy ones, but the dependency footprint is non-trivial. All right, so here's how the planning works at a high level. Like I'm going to go through this a couple of times at various details, but when you know you see you get the SQL query, it starts a text. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who knows how a SQL engine works, but I just want to talk through the data fusion language for this. Uh, you you start with SQL planning, right? So you get a text, you plan it. It turns into something called a logical plan, right? That is the high level query plan of relational operator trees. Postgres calls that a query plan, uh, query tree, I believe. It's been a while since I screwed around with Postgres, um, and that has you do high level planning on that, which I'll talk about. Then there's a step that goes physical planning. You have a lower level execution plan, so that would be called an access plan or an operator tree, perhaps. I think Postgres calls it a plan tree. And then there's a subsequent phase called execute in Data Fusion, which actually creates the streams or the like what would be called operators. So the, those those things are the actual things that are touching the data, calling the arrow kernels, like doing like doing the low level vectorized operations. So that's that's the high level planning flow, and I'm going to talk through sort of each part of that in, in detail. But again, like this is not like earth shattering. This is basically how every other system is implemented, but these are the terms that data fusion uses. 
And then you, I should point out that the output of these things is, is arrow record batches. So record batches are just sets of arrow rows. So they're like horizontal slices of a, of a table that's flowing through. All right, so let's talk about SQL planning front end, logical planning. Again, you start with text, right? Here's a pretty simple select project grouping query. Uh, it would go through a SQL parser. We use SQL parser. It's a whole, uh, I could talk all sorts about the crazy set of um, what qualifies as SQL, but that's a whole different talk maybe. So you get a class, you know, you get an AST parse tree and then that AST parse tree goes through planner, you get a logical plan, right? This is, is how, again, well, basically every other system you would expect should work. Um, Data Fusion also has other ways to build logical plans, which I wanted to highlight. The first is there's like a data frame looking kind of API. This this is definitely a data frame API modeled on what Spark innovated, right? You, you read the table, then you filter it, you use some sort of like, a, you know, way to build up expressions that looks kind of fluent, I think is the name for this. And then you aggregate it, right? So, so you can build that. Um, but under the covers, it's just literally building the same logical plan. So after, after it builds a logical plan, all the rest of the execution is exactly the same. And you can probably guess where I'm going. Here we hit our first like ex uh, extension point. If you want, you people want to build your own fancy customized query language, what you do, like what you do, and we, we've done this in Influx, hopefully Paul will talk about it, is um, you just build a logical plan, right? Like you have to write your own code to do what, like implement whatever semantics you want, but it just spits out a logical plan. And once you've created that, the rest, the whole rest of the planning flow is the same. So this, this is the extension point that if you want to support your own custom language, which is a bunch of examples, like we have Influx QL, you know, people implement PromQL and Vega Fusion and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, here's how you do it. You don't have to re-implement the whole rest of the database system to, to run. And so, uh, again, people who, if you've been around databases, this should be like a review, but I just wanted to talk this through in case you haven't seen this, right? These logical plans are basically data flow graphs, right? They're relational operators. It's a fancy name, but like at the end of the day, you read them from the bottom to the top. I don't know why you do this, but the leaves are at the bottom. The root is at the top. So it's an upside down tree. And so when you're thinking about logically what they represent, they represent data flowing from sources down to the bottom, flowing up through the plan, eventually to the to the root, which is going back to the user. So in this case, you'd scan first, then there'd be a filter applied, and then you do some sort of aggregation. Right? So that's that's what a logical plan represents. Same thing for a physical plan. I just thought I needed to talk about this. So here is a sampling of the types of logical plans that are included in data fusion. You don't have to read all these. However, it basically has all the classic things you'd want, right? Project, filter, window, aggregate, sorts, all the stuff. And I think another important one that you can see is there's actually an extension node here. So that means if you want a logic, you know, like something in your logical plan that is not built into data fusion, you just stick stick a version of that in there. And uh, and that seems to work pretty well. Do you support creating, in creating indexes? People would definitely implement indexes, yes. Okay. Uh, using on top of data fusion. Although I don't okay. think I talked too much about that in this talk. All right, thanks. Definitely have people who've done that. There's not a there's not a lot of like built in support in Data Fusion for indexes, but you can you can build it. The Lance guys might talk about that. I think they are pretty heavy users of indexes. Um, I just wanted to show there's like, you know, what do these APIs actually look like? You don't have to read this code or like what you're going to. But like this is Rust code, and the point like this is just basically showing how you'd build this logical plan using Rust code, either with the logical plan builder or the data frame. They're very similar. My point of showing you this is that it's, it's very straightforward, right? You just you make this builder thing, you say filter, you build, you got yourself a logical plan. So it's not complicated to go build build this thing. It's not some esoteric API. And it's got a lot of the other APIs that if you were ever building one of these things, you have to write yourself. If you use data fusion, you don't have to, right? You can use APIs to walk them and rewrite them and to pretty print them and to serialize them to bytes so you can send them over the network and all that sort of stuff. Um, which again, is like the nuts and bolts, not super exciting, but like if you had to build a system, this is all pieces that you need probably to, to do it for real. The way data is represented in, in Data Fusion, actually I said they were record batches, right? So that they're um, arrays flowing through the system. It's actually not quite that. In the, in, during the execution, they're one of two things. They're either an array, right? This is an arrow array of, of values, right? So that's a columnar arrow array, or it's a scalar value, which is a special case, single single constant. Right. And that, that single constant is important, like critical to special case that in many places, uh, if you've ever implemented these. So, so these are the two that we have, and that seems to have worked pretty well. Right now, we currently use the arrow type system for both the logical and the physical type system. It's not ideal because the arrow type system has, like it encodes some of the physical encodings in the type system. So you have like a logical difference between a like, dictionary array and a normal array, which is not ideal. 
uh, we're talking about making that a little bit more distinct, but that's that's how it currently is. We, the upside is it just uses arrow types everywhere, so that's pretty straightforward. Can this can the Scala type be a, a computation of some other thing, or it's already computed? At this point, it's already computed. There's a bunch of there's optimizers which I'll talk about. Which if you have an expression that's that's a constant, right? The optimizer will rewrite it to a, a scalar value. Yeah. Yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about briefly was functions, right? So all the functions are actually implemented. Yeah, there's no distinction between built-in or user-defined functions. They're all implemented using the same API. Rust calls it a trait, but it's like the equivalent of an interface in C, uh, Java, or I can't remember what the C++ was it's called, the virtual virtual method or something. Anyway, they're all implemented this, with the same API. I'll go show up very briefly. You can implement scalar, aggregate, window functions, table functions, right? They all have different interfaces you got to implement, but but you can do it. And they're all in terms of arrow. Uh, Prepackage what comes with data fusion, right? To make sure that out of the box it works well, is it's basically got a big library of, of existing functions, mostly like Postgres compatible. Um, and then there's community maintained packages, like if you want Spark versions of functions or you want JSON functions, or there's a bunch of other ones that you, you know, since everything's just a user defined function, if you don't like how a particular one operates, you just override it and provide your own. And there's no reason why it can't go as fast as the built in ones. There's also actually kind of cool is built in hooks for create function syntax, right? So uh, if you want to, for example, build, um, we have a, this cool example for building PyTorch, right? Like create user defined function model, blah, 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 as PyTorch, you know, whatever. Um, Data Fusion has done that built in, but it's got the hooks and people actually can build, you know, uh, build that on top. So you should check out the example if you want to see how that works. Here, I just want to give like, you know, that's all kind of high level. I could make slideware all day long, but I'll show you the, the way the code looks. The point of this is it's not super complicated, right? What does a user-defined function look like? You have to define some interface. Oops, sorry. Um, the point is you, you define what function types, uh, what argument types the function takes. In this case, it takes one integer 32-bit 32, uh, 32 integer argument. Um, Data fusion, if you try to call it with a 64-bit argument, right, will cast it automatically and make sure that it gets called with one of these appropriate signatures. You have to give it some information, like what the name of the function is and what the return type is and some other stuff. Um, and then you act, then here's an example of how you actually implement this function, right? So this is an example where uh, you, you get the thing, you get you get the arguments as the array of these columnar values, right? So those are either the arrays or the scalars. You have to return a columnar value. This is the arrow. Um, this happens to turn the scalar. This is a very simple way to implement a function, but but it works. Uh, it turns the scalar value into an array, then it gets this thing as an array. Right? If, it, if, if what came in was a scalar value, there's no special case for scalar value. It'll just downcast it to an array. And then here's the arrow API to build a new arrow array right? that actually adds one to the number and it handles nulls. Um, and so this is not the fastest way to write this function, but it but it works. And it's probably, you know, it's, it's actually, it'll still be pretty fast. Um, and if you want to, you could then go implement all the special cases uh, if, if it was important. But a lot of people right. just like start with basic one. Yeah, go ahead. Andrew, so Pedro has a question uh, from, 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 yeah. from, from Bellox. How does data fusion handle scalar functions with complex types, arrays, maps, rows, et cetera? So, uh, because it uses the arrow type system, the columnar array, like the scalar values have a variant that is represented from lists or structs or whatever. And so you can get arrow struct arrays or arrow list arrays here and manipulate them. And I will be honest, if you try to show the, uh, let, let's just say the, a, the APIs for manipulating the structure types is not as nice as this one, uh, but I'm not sure that is anything related. I'm not sure how much makeup you can do. But yeah, you just you just get an arrow struct array and do whatever you want with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so it would look the same. You just call different APIs. Uh, all right. So the catalogs, the catalogs. Oh, are sorry, I had a quick question before we move on. Um, where is the like selection information being stored? Col column or value is just a scalar or an array, right? So like, right. is There's the no scalar no UDF applied to rows that are already filtered out? Um, what actually happens? Or... Well. So there's no selection vector. That's what you're asking. Instead, actually, the arrays get copied, right? So only the values that pass the filter are copied on. So the subsequent like operations only see the rows. That I see. Are... So you you materialize after every predicate. After every filter, yes, yes. Filter, got it. I you know I meant to ask everyone to say who they are. But, so that's Ryan Marcus, the premier database professor I, from, Pe sorry. from Penn. From Penn. <laughs> hey, sorry, sorry, no, no problem. No, and I think you know we've actually found this is an aside. I, um, 
sometimes it's actually faster to get everything all lined back up into a single, uh, you know, contiguous memory block. So the next time you go blast through it, it's much faster. But on the other hand, sure. sometimes you copy a bunch of data that, that you know, uh, over and over again, that is not as necessary. It's a design decision, right? I'm sure I can make up a case where <laughs> uh, not doing that is optimal, right? But yeah. Yeah, so we, there's, there's no selection, there's no equivalent of selection vectors in data fusion right now. Um, all right, so moving on to the catalog API. So the catalog API, what actually comes prepackaged, catalog is like what tables exist, what schemas exist, that kind of stuff. What comes with data fusion is two, this memory based one, that's like ephemeral, goes away when you stop down. And there's also one that's like a directory of files. And then there's a catalog API for everything else. The reason there's nothing else, nothing more sophisticated for catalog is that I'm, in my belief, the catalog format is super use case specific, right? So anything more specific than like a directory of files is likely not to be super widely applicable. So maybe that's just an excuse, but that's why there's not any one other. And, but we've gotten pretty far with just memory files and this API. And again, the API is like not complicated. It's like, hey, tell me all the tables that are in your schema, right? What are their names? given a name, give me the thing that provides me the data about it, right? So it's like the API is not complicated to implement. Of course, you know, implementing a catalog is probably pretty complicated, but the other thing I wanted to point out is this thing's async, right? So this actually means you can do network transfer here, right? If you have a remote, a remote catalog, for example. Um, are there, are there like existing implementations that like speak to like each catalog or unity or oh, yeah. whatever? Yeah, well, or uh, like Iceberg, right? Iceberg has an yeah, yeah. that that talks to the remote catalogs. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Yep. Uh, and that way you don't like have to have all the information for all the tables before you start planning. You do have, I mean, you do have to know all the names, uh, but, but anyway, that's, that's a sort of a detail. I don't know if people are familiar with like what, what a catalog, like a directory catalog based file format is, or like what the standard hive based directory partition was. This is, this is terrifying, but this is what's built in data fusion. We didn't invent this. We just kind of follow the same model. So basically we treat a directory of files. Like in this case, there's a directory called table one with two parquet files in it. It'll treat that as a, as a single table, right? So you can just select that as a table and out comes the values and data fusion will merge whatever these, the schemas are and pattern with nulls or whatever. Crazier is if you have a table like this, it actually has two subdirectories. In this case, the directory literally, literally has a name, date equals whatever this, you know, uh, June 1st. Like this is, this is the directory name. And Data Fusion will effectively inject another column called date into your table, right? That has this value when it does, when it combines all these files. And also, if you put a predicate on, like, I only want the tables and date, you know, June 2nd, you'll actually only take the files from this directory. So this is not something data fusion invented. This is like hive style partitioning. Database purists think it's horrible, but it actually is super uh, common in the real world. So, and it like, it has problems, but it seems to be good. So anyway, data fusion does do that, which is kind of cool. The, the prepackaged one. In terms of table providers and table formats, there's a whole bunch, like it includes common file formats like CSV, JSON, Parquet, Avro, and Arrow. There's a whole bunch of community provided ones like that basically just use the API and then they've implemented interfaces for like SQLite or MySQL or whatever. You can check those out. And then again, there's this table provider API. The table provider API has a bunch of things, but mostly this is the main API for it. When you want when data fusion wants to read data, it calls scan and it passes projection filter, push down projections, push down filters, push down limits. So the which columns to read, which expressions to apply if you have some limit of number of rows. And, if, and it returns an execution plan, which we'll talk about a lot. But like, basically, this is an example. You want to do your own custom data format. You don't now have to go all implement all the the the, the, the query processing and uh, optimization passes. Like, push the predicates down into the scan, right? Like that data fusion does that. Now, of course, you've got to go actually do something with the predicates and stuff that get pushed. But at least you get them right here, and they're they're pretty straightforward. Uh, and you, there's some reporting stuff that has to go on too. But that's that's about it. I think I'm very proud of the Parquet exec, partly this because a lot of the users of Data Fusion are very like care a lot about Parquet. And so consequently a huge amount of investments gone into this particular one. But I think if you look at the Parquet reader that's in Data Fusion, it's it's about it has about as all the tricks that I that I know that you can play with Parquet readers. So it does like all the different row group and data page prunings based on statistics and predicate range analysis. It does late materialization, like it'll actually read only some columns, apply the filters, and then only materialize values from the subsequent columns that match the first, and you can actually skip data pages if you prune out enough. And it does, you know, you can cache the metadata, you can do IO pushdowns, it only fetches the pages you need, all blah, 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 blah. You can actually pass external inf uh, index information in if you want to see how that works. So I, I mean, like this is just meant to be a high level overview. You can read more about it this blog. 
but like if you want to see the level of sophistication you can get with this API, I think it's it's pretty pretty sophisticated. Um, but it, like, there's also a lot of code that does this. All right, so moving on. The next thing Data Fusion does is logical query optimization. So what does logical query optimization mean? It's basically you have a logical plan. You, there's a rewrite that goes on that tries to make the basically compute the same thing, but does it faster, right? There's a bunch of these that are built in, and then uh, you still get a logical plan of the output. The classic ones that are prepackaged, the ones that you always need, like the push down projections, limits, and filters, simplify expressions that got asked earlier, right? Like if you've got an expression that's like five times, uh, well, maybe more practical ones like extract the, the year from some timestamp, right? You don't want to evaluate that in every row. Instead, you evaluate it once at plan time. So that's that's built in, right? That that happens here. There's subquery decorrelations, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, there's an API. So if you don't like what's in there, you need something new, you can add your own. And the API literally is you get the logical plan and you have to return a logical plan, some signal of whether or not you've rewritten it. So like the point of showing you this is not that you need to like learn how to code it. It's just like the APIs are not that complicated uh, in my opinion. So another thing that might be interesting about the optimizer. So, you know, optimizer, there's like a whole bunch of, basically I would classify optimizations into two categories. One is like, you always do them. Like you always simplify expressions. You always, you know, you practically always decorrelate subqueries. And then there's join ordering. So join ordering is like, you know, which order do you joins? Uh, I would say what's in Data Fusion is uh, basically a semantic optimizer. Thank you, Andy, for giving me that terminology so I can call it something good. I believe. Hey, don't, don't thank me. Thank Larry Ellison. Larry Ellison. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. Larry Ellison. Lots of you. Face you don't hear very often. <laughs> yeah. So, so, hey, Larry Ellison's company gave me my first job. I, 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 I don't hold ill will towards him. Anyway, so what semantic optimizer means basically is you plan the joins and the orders like they like, appear in the query that you like wrote them. Um, and then if I'm honest, there's like just enough to avoid TPCH disasters, which I'll talk about, but like, that's, that's it, right? Like realistically, there's not a sophisticated joint ordering algorithm in here. And I wouldn't claim that there is. If you want to know why, possibly it's an excuse, but realistically, it's also born off my PTSD from working on the Vertica optimizer for four years, which is cardinality estimation is really hard. It's basically unsolved. People still write papers about it. It's still unsolved. And without that complex rejoin ordering is really, really hard. And so rather than try to do it, the better story in data fusion is you could just use the API, right? You write your own query. If you want whatever optimizer you want to write, you can write it yourself, right? But we don't have some, some, something in there. I think also it helped a lot that data fusion is largely focused on these OLAP workloads where denormalized tables are more important, more and more important these days. So because probably because joins are so bad and you can get reasonable compression back with the denormalized format. So, you know, a lot of people just say, screw it. We're not going to do joins. We're going to do it once at load. And then we don't have to worry about the query on time. So that's what we do for joint ordering. I'll talk about the implications of that later. Uh, all right, moving on to physical planning, right? This, again, is kind of review. I've gone over this, but the way physical planning works is you start with logical plan and eventually you get to this execution plan thing. And the execution plan thing eventually executes and generates multiple streams of these arrow record batches. And those streams are the actual operators that do the work. And then each of those streams incrementally creates a record batch as you go through the computation. Actually, uh Andrew, someone has a question uh, pretty about the optimizer. I'm wondering if the soundness correctness of the results produced by the optimizer passes are insured. How is it guaranteed the results of the optimizer is the same as the unoptimized plan? Which is a fair question. Yeah, uh, there's a check to make sure at least the schemas come out that are the same. But otherwise, I don't think there, there's no, I'm not sure there's a theoretical way to validate that they compute the same same answer. It's, it's basically on you, right? If you make an optimizer pass that changes the semantic meaning of the plan, it's uh, it's going to be a bug. I mean, the, we do check the we do check the schema that 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 is that that it does check but um yeah. but the because we had bugs related to that early on um all right so the executor model overview uh data fusion is a like it's classic volcano style pull based I'll explain how this works it works great it has exchange operators of the equivalent it's a streaming engine that means it doesn't buffer stuff internally unless it has to so like it typically operates on batches of rows I believe it's, it's approximately eight thousand by default. Uh, obviously, if you have to like sort the whole data set or you have to group, like do some big hash grouping, it's going to buffer the, the data, although it does have spill into disk. It definitely does multi-cores, keeps all your cores very busy. It uses something called Tokyo for thread scheduling. I'll talk about that um, in a bit. And then it's got a cooperative resource tracking system that does memory pools, which I'll also talk briefly about. 
So in order to talk about these, I need to talk a little bit about part, like the, the terminology. The first thing is partitions. I'm sure the volcano model has a term for this, but I, I can't remember what it's called. Basically in a plan, if you saw like a filter exec like this, right, it would say maybe four partitions on it. What actually happens at runtime is there's four distinct instances of the stream that correspond, right? So in this case there's like literally four things. Uh, hopefully there's fourth cores that you can keep busy, but they're all cranking through the filter, all in parallel, not talking to each other, just doing doing great. But so the planning works on these single nodes, right? It's not like if you have 20 partitions, you have 20 filter execs, you have one of them, you do all the plans, and then when you actually go to run them, they they expand out. So, that's, so that makes sense. So these partitions are just these in, in, in incremental streams. Um, something so, else? Sorry, I mean, you, like why, so why pool-based? Why Volcano, given that, you know, okay. the, like at least the latest research is showing yes. the push-based model is yes. better. DuckDB yes. certainly did, did a major rewrite. I'm glad you asked that question because I have slides just about that exact question. All right, let um, it rip. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me get, let me get the, I'll get there in like two or three slides. Okay. Um, so yes, in fact, that's part of why I wrote the, the Sigma paper. So people stopped asking me that question. So the, okay, so sort orders. I also want to just point out briefly that Data Fusion actually has a pretty sophisticated sort order tracking system. So that means the execution plans themselves kind of know what order the output of the, that they come out in, right? So in this case, uh, you might know that the data is sorted by B, right? Then A, and what the optimizers can do is they, they then can get rid of, like, if you ask for the data sorted by B and A and your execution node can report that it's sorted by B and A, the optimizer will skip actually trying to sort the data. So for, I think, analytics systems, that's very important, uh, typically, because that's one of the only, like, types of indexes you have is the physical clustering of data. We do the same thing for window functions. Yeah. So let me, uh, physical optimizer, sorry, I got to do this. Then we'll get to the Tokyo stuff, which I know everyone's excited about. So the... Physical optimizer does basically the same thing. It just rewrites these trees, but instead of working on logical plans, it works on physical plans. Here's the types of optimizers that are included, including something that basically sets up the parallelism. The sorting uh, ensures that the stuff that, you know, if you need to have the data sorted, it'll insert sorts. It'll pick join algorithms. It'll do things like if you know the value of a scan based off just the statistics, like count star, right? You can replace that with statistics that happens at this level. Again, the API looks basically like you get an input and output, you have to rewrite it. Um, all right, let's talk about, yes, I wanna talk about here, we're gonna get to Tokyo, I gotta get there. So as I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of prepackaged implementations in here, right? Like I don't think you need to rewrite filters or projections, although you can if you want. Uh, it's got the full range of sorting. We've obsessed about merging for a lot of things. There's like a special implementation for limit. We've got fancy two-phase vectorized hashing thing that you can read all about with a bunch of blogs. We have all the joins that you need, hash join, merge join, s loops join, the sort merge join, and also spills. And if you don't know what left semi and right and anti, like it does all, they do all these too. If you don't know what that means, it's fine. But like, that's basically what you need to implement subqueries. Have uh, you guys thought, have you thought about worst case optimal joins? We have not. Okay. Um, th th this is, it just got these standard ones. Um, although there's no reason you couldn't write your own. And then the window functions, we use sort-based window calculations. We don't use like physical segment trees, which I think is the hot new uh, research paper, but you know, the sort-based one works just fine uh, from what we what we can see. It actually works very well with streaming implementations. Um, this is the API. I'm, I am gonna get to the execution plan in just a second. So the way execution plan works is you, you call execute and you get one of these record batch streams back. And then there's also a ways to report the properties. Like I was describing the sort order before, right? This is the way that the execution plans report information about how they're sorted and partitioned and stuff. They, they track it and there's a whole bunch more functions here. So that's how the optimizers are written generically, not in terms of the existing operator. I have a question about this. Um, is there a reason that you guys decided to go with dyna dynamic dispatch and trait objects versus like Rust standard, like enums, for example? Is it is the only reason to allow for other people to implement stuff like with this trait involved? Can you, yeah. can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, ba basically, yes, right? If it's a trait, it's a dynamic trait that's the equivalent of like a, a virtual function, uh, like an object in something like Java. So the fact that this is a trait, everything's implemented in terms of this means that you can implement all your own operators, extension operators using the exact same API. And like the overhead of calling this function once per execution is very small. Do you see any overhead in um, like basically having to do that dynamic dispatch for every single node? Okay. No, I mean, because it does it's once per plan, right? And then each node sits there and cranks through giant swaths of 8,000 rows a piece, right? Like over the course of the, the plan. So it's not like this gets called every row, right? This gets called once per 
operator per per partition, right? So they're like a filter, it's gonna be called 16 times and the 16 cores in your system is gonna be called 16 times, um, which is, we don't see that at all. Here is, so now I'm gonna start talking a little bit about how stuff does go cross core. So the upside of a pull-based model, right, is that actually most operators are just, a, they look like they're single core, right? They, they just have to worry about like their input stream and their output stream, do the calculation. They don't have to worry about the, the shuffling across cores. They don't have to be multi-threaded. They're easy to write. Because of course, there are operators that handle them. So there's one called coalesce partitions, which like combines everything into a single stream. That's if you want to do something like a global limit or you're trying to like return results as a single stream to the user. And then there's the classic repartition, which is the equivalent of the exchange operator, right? Which will actually shuffle data around to the, from a bunch of threads to other threads through some complicated thing, which can do hash repartitioning. This one's definitely complicated and uh, has had a bunch of tuning. But that's so that you know there's the classic exchange operator right there. Memory disk management um, is done by cooperatively reporting the giant allocations and ignoring the small ones and assuming they're accounted for on some slop, right? So like you account the, for the big allocations in the hash tables or the sort buffers or whatever, but you're not tracking all the individual like intermediate record batches that are flowing between the nodes, which makes you know, this is tenable, you could probably do better, but this actually works pretty well. Your prepackaged memory, of course, is in trade, so you can provide your own implementation of memory pool, but the basic one is just, it'll give operators as much memory as they ask for until it runs out, and then there's another one that tries to divide the memory fairly across operators that could spill. Neither one of those is particularly great for like a really high performance workload, but it, it work okay, and you can implement your own more sophisticated ones. All right, let's talk about scheduling, everyone's favorite topic. So, Data Fusion uses something called Tokyo. It's implement like it implements the CPU bound work on a Tokyo uh, thread pool, which is called the runtime. Tokyo is this thing that came out of the Rust ecosystem. It, it was designed for networking, I know, uh, but it turns out it has a very good, uh, high quality work stealing thread scheduler, <clears throat> and even better because it uses the built-in features of Rust, specifically async, you, be you basically get built-in continuations, which I'll talk about in a second. So basically, if you have to do IO or something, right, in your middle of doing one of these operations, uh, the Tokyo scheduler handles that and can basically take off and, and do your IO and come back and rerun you when you're ready. But if you're ready and like you're doing an aggregate and you need in, in, um, <clears throat> the next batch of input, you can immediately just ask your input filter, and that will then effectively immediately call the scan, do the work, and the the thing will get passed up all in the same core. Um, so, so it does, the stuff does get passed and you have the hook to do IO, but you don't have to um, worry about a bunch of the details. So I think in a lot of ways, it's the best of both worlds, in my opinion. I, I realize that not everyone's com uh, convinced, but I have, I'm sad to say, actually implemented my own thread pool a couple of times and I'm super, super happy not to have had to do it again, right? Because it like, you can get it. It's very easy to get it working 99.9% .9 of the time. And then you spend a huge amount of time getting it working in all the stupid corner cases, like when it shuts down or when there's something that's like hanging and blah, blah, blah. Like it's just a giant pain in the ass um, to get it working well and to make sure it works really well under high load and have it like steal work across threads and stuff. It's like, it's not impossible, but it's, if you don't have to do it it's, and you can use someone else, it's great. Um, so the way this is actually implemented, and again, I'm going to get to the how it works in a second, is that you call a stream, right? You get one of these streams, and then this is the code that you would write, basically. And, and like this is basically the inner loop of either filter or grouping or something, right? You'd, you'd effectively get, you'd write it as though you could get the next street, uh, batch of input. You do something to the next batch, and then if you were done, you could return it. Otherwise, you just keep in this loop processing, right? So the thing is this magic await. This is actually this actually turns into a return. Like the compiler will generate a return back to the scheduler here. Through details, I probably don't even understand myself enough to explain them. But it's effectively generate like this generating multi uh, like cooperative continuations here. So if this next stream is not ready because like it's reading data over the network, what will actually happen is this will return control of the scheduler, which will go find something else to do. Uh, and then when the when it's ready, the schedule will eventually call you back. And so from your perspective as the programmer, you just wrote this straight line code. But to actually happen is you had to return, and then, then it's uh, it's coming back when it's ready. But if it's immediately ready, it just sits here in the loop and does does the next thing. Right. So that's that's how you get the pull based when it's ready. But if you actually had to return control, uh, it already happens. 
that's probably too much for this. So, you know, whatever, you get you get record batches. Okay. So how will this work in practice? I would totally do it again. I'm obviously a fanboy, right? But like I have no regrets about this at all. Partly it's because I've done a bunch of different versions of of this, right? Like like I've written my own scheduler and it like it's not fun. I think a lot of people complain about the Rust like stream ecosystem, just having like yes, it's bad, but like, compared to everything else, it's like the the least bad of all the other options. We actually, interestingly, you go back and we actually tried to implement a push-based morsel scheduler, right? Morsel driven scheduler based on Rayon, which is the other popular scheduler in Rust. You, it's, it's actually a very interesting PR. The conclusion is like one of one of the smart data, Influx data guys tried this because he, he really didn't like Tokyo basically. And he, um, Raphael, like he, he desperately wanted to show, show that it was not like that he could do better and he just couldn't, right? And he, and he spent a lot of time, it was very complicated. Um, but basically he couldn't show there was no significant benefits uh over over using tokyo so we uh we got rid of it and i don't think we've ever done that now of course um, as i was yeah. hinting at before like basically every month people would show up and be like hey we read this great paper called morsel driven parallelism you know and duckdb used it and so did velox and therefore we you know why doesn't data fusion use it it'll be much better um and so the conclusion is you so, so partly like we ran a bunch of experiments which i'll talk about the conclusion is you don't you can do very good Works great with many cores. Works great with I/O. Uh, you, you don't need to use push-based scheduler, um, although you do when you use this Tokyo system. It's very easy if you're not careful to run CPU and I/O on the same thread pool. You, you do need to be careful about that. But um, but but here's here's it. So let me talk about performance. So, so basically, my my conclusion is yes. I know I know a lot about this paper. I know not only do I know the authors. I, I, like I've read this carefully, and I understand that other systems have claimed that they needed to go with this system, but. Uh, it was not our experience. I, I wonder how much because because it's essentially coroutine. Does that solve like ninety percent of the problem that they were trying to solve? Yeah. yeah well, the, well, the Rust compiler generate like it's not exactly a coroutine because it doesn't have a whole stack. It just like the compiler generates the continuation for you, so it it, it basically yeah. marshals all the local variables into some structure that then gets stored on the stack. Uh, gets stored in the heap rather, right, and then returns control. So like. The beauty is the compiler is doing all that work for you. Like I've worked on, like my first compiler job was like we had to do that stuff manually. It was a giant pain in the ass. Like it worked, but but it was it was it was not cool. But the fact that but the like, Rust compiler does it for you is like. Hmm. But like with Tokyo, like you can tell it to cancel, like a, you know, a, a pending. Yeah. Yeah. So like that's like to do that without without. I mean, it's essentially coroutines without like that mechanism. We have we have to pass back null and say hey stop, or right. have, to have like yeah like. I'm saying like the, the having the the control logic control plane s still now separated with the data plane. I think maybe gets you maybe is the key you know the key reasons. And one of the things the DuckDB guy brings up too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's beautiful to have like like you don't want you want the scheduler to be canceled, and so it actually works great. Like you cancel data fusion, and like because because it's all can like it all um, you yeah. don't have to like handle all that canceling implicit uh, explicitly because it's all sort of. Uh, automatically been generated so all the cleanup happens all the just the equivalent of the structures get called um it, it's a really nice like I, I i'm again i'm a huge fan so like maybe i shouldn't be the one telling like like some of the downsides of it but like it's it's great okay, um awesome. a question to, to andrew uh, so okay. how much of the heavy lifting do you think that tokyo is doing then because it seems like because uh, to, to add on to what andy said like a lot of the like the, the benefits of tokyo is like from that work ceiling right and generally when we're using like when we for push based uh, models, like it's because we have that finer grain control and we can implement uh, uh, elasticity. But with Tokyo, like everything's work stealing, right? So, do, do you so, think? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, one of the downsides is it, it doesn't, you have to basically set the plan, the uh, uh, parallelism at plant time, right? Like, so there's no dynamic, like scaling up or down with CPU resources during execution. I happen to, in the sense of like, if I all of a sudden decide I want to not use 16 cores, I only want to use three, you can't, I mean, yes. You I, are you saying that in Tokyo or? I'm saying or... if you try to do that in data fusion, the plans are still set up to have 16 copies of everything. Right. So if you yeah. actually scaled the threads down, everything would start thrashing. It would be much less efficient than, um, which is perhaps what you're talking about work scaling. But like, in my my experience, it's very, like, C, like the fact that, uh, sorry, in my experience, needing to switch CPU down during execution is actually typically like the last resource. It's not the resource you run out of first. You almost always run out of RAM first. And that's, you can't just steal away the same way you can steal with um, scheduler. And like over scheduling a CPU with a couple extra threads, uh, 
you know, it's not the end of the world, especially if the other threads aren't doing like, like massive computations. So in other words, I'm just kind of like hand waving away and saying, I don't think runtime dynamicism of CPU is all that important, which probably depends on your use case, but that was, that's the one that I've seen. Um, yeah. So now I, I just want to briefly talk in the last couple of minutes. I want to like sort of summarize the, some of the results from the paper we did. And part of this was like, we did, we compared against DuckDB. I, my conclusion, the TLDR is that the differences in performance is a hundred percent engineering effort really than the architecture, right? Like, you can have a shitty architecture, but like, as long as you get a good enough one, which data fusion has, I think you get just as good performance. And um, I think part of the, like data fusion is getting better. We got a whole bunch of cool stuff in the pipeline, probably another 20, 30% coming um, by doing crazier things that's not related. So here I keep hinting at this. Here's my fancy. I love this chart. Maybe it's overwhelming. What this is, is we ran the ClickBench queries, which are aggregate heavy queries, right? Aggregate and filtering, there are no joins in here. And with these, the x-axis is number of cores and it goes from one to 172 uh, or maybe one, yeah, 172. Uh, and uh, and <clears throat> we just ran each of the queries individually in DuckDB and DataFusion. And the whole point of this chart is like, basically, if you look at the shapes of these curves, they're basically the same. Yes, they're not all the same. Sometimes DataFusion is faster, sometimes DuckDB is faster, but there's like, there's no fundamental like, wall that data fusion hits right or that the DuckDB doesn't have or the DuckDB has or data fusion that like they basically show the same scaling properties so my conclusion of that is that there's no fundamental difference in the scheduler right that, pre that precludes you from getting good performance scalability up to 172 cores any one of these individual queries i'm sure we can make faster right we can talk about why it goes up faster you know for data fusion than DuckDB here or whatever but i don't think it's related to the scheduler i have a, another question sorry last question about this uh so the these these benchmarks, uh, if I remember correctly from the paper, these are like re they're they're all within memory, right? They're like fourteen gigabytes, uh, and the machine you guys were running these experiments on were very like I think like three hundred something gigabytes of RAM. Uh, yeah. What do, do you know? What the comparison looks like when you start approaching out of memory workloads, or does Data Fusion ha handle that at all, or? Because the operators do, do do spilling. I don't think they've had anywhere near the amount of invest. In fact, I'm sure they haven't anywhere near the amount of investment that DuckDBs won't have. So that's an area. If anyone's interested in making like really fast spilling operators, we'd love to have uh, love to have some smart people work on it. But but like I would, I think I would would be untruthful. I was like, oh, it works great, you know, out of court. Like there's they, there's definitely code that, that exists that works, but I think there's a there's like several factors of of uh, performance there. If you if anyone cares. Okay, right, thank you. So, but yeah, I know the Duck DVD guys, I think I've spent quite a lot of effort there and I think it shows. All right. The other experiment that we did that I want to touch on briefly is the single core. You know, there's like, that's the scaling one. Then we also did single core efficiency. I don't expect you to like read this table, right? I purpose is kind of shitty, but this is, we just ran a single core. We just ran the, the different queries and we saw which uh, system was faster. And of course, sometimes one system was faster, but sometimes the other system was faster. This was run like a year ago, right? So this probably doesn't reflect the latest things, but basically we found at a high level, highly selected predicates. This is by the way, on the click, uh, the parquet data, right? It's not DuckDB's magic um, special uh, proprietary format. It's it's the click bin, just like the raw parquet queries. So things that are highly selected predicates, data fusion was faster, probably because of all the effort we put into the, the parquet scan. Thing um, actually, it turns out for some reason, if you have no no group I, right, if it's just a single aggregate of all the data, data fusion was faster for some reason. It's probably because it's better vectorized or something. I, I don't fully understand why, but um, when the queries had more sort of medium selectivity or medium car grouping cardinality, the performance was pretty similar. Sometimes data fusion was faster, sometimes DuckDB was faster. And then DuckDB was quite a bit faster for high cardinality groups, which you can probably guess is part of why people in data fusion are uh, the data fusion community are somewhat obsessed about making high cardinality group by faster. And you know, I, if you care, I can say this has nothing to do with scaling. It has everything to do with how you manage the intermediate group state as it passes through the multi-phase group by. Um, if anyone cares, I can geek out about that at length, but I'm not going to do it here. <clears throat> uh, the other thing we did, of course, we ran TPCH as one does. Basically the conclusion is the, this is all the paper, like you can read all this in the paper if you want all the details, but basically conclusion is it's pre they're pretty similar. There's a couple of real outliers where data fusions was terrible, right? These were actually joint order disasters, as you can guess, in particular sub, you know, sub query cardinality estimation was wrong. And so it got the, the different orders, blah, 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 blah. So, which we subsequently fixed after the paper, but which is where the, you know, just enough to avoid this joint order disasters comes from. But, you know, basically it's the same is my conclusion. We also ran this H2O grouping thing. 
it turns out this benchmark, even though they don't, you know, it's, it's called like some data science grouping benchmark, whatever, from h2o.ai. It's really a test of how fast your CSV parser is, from what I can tell, because all the input data is all CSV. So it turns out data fusion happens to have a pretty fast CSV parser, at least it did here. There's not, it wasn't 100% clear what was going on with DuckDB. I'm sorry, there's uh, we filed some ticket. It, it might actually, they actually might be faster because they use some different code paths or something with sing, single client. I can't remember. But it's basically, you know, it, we were fast, it was nice and fast. A couple of times when it was bad is because we had crappy implementations of media and then correlation. Uh, the aggregate functions. We subsequently made median much better. Correlation is still crappy. Again, if anyone would like to make that faster, it's just a matter, you know, simple matter of coding, as one of my mentors once upon a time said. Uh, yeah. So with that, I think that's I made it through. It's under an hour, barely. But uh, come, <laughs> you know, come, come with us. We're we're building this stuff. It's great. A bunch of people made made really cool systems on top of it. I think you'll hear a bunch about them in the next couple of weeks. But uh, but yeah, thank you. Awesome. So I will. Yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. Clap on behalf of everyone. Uh, and for people, admit, the simple matter of coding is a stonebreakerism. <laughs> favorite lines. Uh, all right, we have time for one or two questions. There's a lot. I think a lot of questions showed up in the chat. Which I'd care. If you want to ask uh, Andrew a question, please unmute yourself and go for it. So um, I had a question. Uh, this is Amol Deshpande from Maryland. Um, so I was looking at the paper quickly and, and thinking about some of the things you said. So you, you are saying that you're not really maintaining any statistics in, inside your catalog, right? It's it's fairly bare bones. Not, not so the built-in catalog. Correct. So is your kind of built-in optimizer then won't be able to do many sort of cost-based optimization? Is yeah. that kind of the design decision for data fusion? That's right. I mean, the, 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 basically, yes. Like there are there is a statistics object that you can provide for the different um, data sources, right, that, that you can provide that information, but the, the only thing, like the built-in data fusion optimizers are very simple. There's no cost-based optimizer in there. There's a bunch of like heuristic reorders, replace the thing with like, if you know count star, right? You know the counts by the statistics, you can replace that, that kind of stuff. If you can prove that yeah. that thing can not generate any results because of the predicate, uh, like evaluations, like like that kind of stuff happens, but there's no like, pick a couple of joy orders and try to cost them and figure out which one will be lower or something like that. Right. Thanks. Of course, you can build another question. I do. Sorry, 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 go ahead. You can build it. You can build that stuff with the APIs that are in Data Fusion, but it's not. It doesn't come with with that. Got it. So another question I had is that you know, so when you parallelize these operations on multiple cores, right? Like there's something like high churn that comes up. There's going to have to be a shuffle between these batches. Does that end up like causing issues with the concurrency and contention? Well, I think we put a lot of effort to try to minimize the contention, but but that that operation to reshuffle data, especially when it does hash partitioning, like that that is a that shows up in the traces, right? the computing the hash values and then shuffling all the data around is definitely a compute intensive operation. But but a lot of effort went into not having like thread contention or something in that that operation. You can go check out the code; it's somewhat cool. somewhat hairy, I would say. But but I mean, it, it's pretty well. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Sam. One or two more questions. I guess I have a question. Hi, I'm Victor uh, from Datadog, but I have a question about the optimizer. I know that the my understanding is the, the built-in optimizer is not doing cascades, but there's thing called this thing called OpD that I've seen mentioned in various places, and I'm guess I'm kind of curious what that's about. And you know, I'm trying to drive Cal, I'm trying to drive data fusion externally with Calcit, but I'm kind of curious to hear if there there might be something cool incoming. Can I take that, Andrew? Yeah, it's not a question for me. There's nothing called yeah. OpD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Opti is our new uh, query optimizer project that is based on data fusion substrate. Uh, it's a very, very early prototype. We're in the process of deciding. It is cascade based. It is cost based. It's very, very early. So I, it, like, we'll hope to share about more about it soon. It will be open source. But yeah, I, I don't want to say it's calcite for data fusion, but like that's that's what we're trying to do. By the way, if, I, I would love to collaborate more. Like, if you have questions, come on. Like, we'd love to make make it easier for you to do whatever you're doing. Like, uh, sure, yes, yeah. All right, one more question. I gotta go. There's nobody else. I'll I'll be the guy who brings up the morsel driven parallelism paper again. Uh, Let's do it. One of the one of the hypotheses in that paper is that the reason the push based morsel system works so well is because each thread basically holds the same morsel all the way through the entire pipeline. Um, yep. Yep. I, I understand that data fusion, uh, you know, materializes predicates and might occasionally make copies of data. Whereas, you know, their proposed system 
very much tries not to do that. Is that potentially where the perf difference is coming from? Or I guess in a more open-ended way, what do you think of their hypothesis that locking a morsel to a thread is good for performance? I think the hypothesis is true. I think you can basically this it implicitly happens the same, like the same effect of the same data that's in the, the CPU cache, right? Like the same uh, data is operated on multiple, like it's pulled through the pipeline and operate on subsequent uh, stages in the, in the, of the same calculation. That, that's exactly what happens during the execution of data fusion, right? But, but you don't need a push-based executor to do that. You can do that with a pull-based. But doesn't, that's doesn't each, if you have to pull between each operator, like sh sh surely there's at least like a cache access somewhere in the Tokyo code to grab your next chunk, right? Like wouldn't that kind of flood potentially be a miss and potentially, uh, well, I guess, I mean, like, like, that like typically, yeah, I, I mean, so like you're passing batches of like 8,000 rows, right? So like, okay, yeah, yeah. Be a couple of extra instructions to schedule the next thing, but like, right. Here, it it out. Go spend to go like process the 8,000 rows. It's like, it basically gets lost in the noise. Yeah, yeah, that oh. makes sense. And you know, like all my my opinion, right? Again, I'm biased. Like all the performance difference I saw in DuckDB has to do with like how, basically how great they are at, multi, at high cardinality aggregates. The reason they're so great is because they had a PhD student basically spend a whole bunch of time, right, from one of the best research universities in the world and databases, making it faster, right? I'm trying to I'm trying to coalesce the same kind of like like excitement around data fusion to get the same level of investment. Like we're getting there, but like yeah. It, it's not about the fun, like that we can't make it faster. It's just someone's got to go like specialize and figure out how to make a, uh, well, if you care, there's a whole, there's a whole exciting discussion on in, in the, in the forums. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Right. So again, uh, let me ask one question. Uh, how many Germans are working on data fusion? Maybe, maybe that's a real test of how, how the, the code quality. Well, at least one of my coworkers is, is in, is in German, not from, not from Tumdal. He's, he's okay. from, uh... <laughs> you, need, you need at least one, right? Um, Okay. Awesome. Again, one of the crazy things. I don't actually know who's working on it, or like I know who shows up and contributes PRs, but I don't yeah. know like often why they're doing it or what they're used to. Like, and sometimes the people like there's some pretty awesome PRs that show up that I like. I don't know where these people come from, but they are clearly excellent database programmers. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Fantastic. 